As you may already know, not all movement practices are designed in an equal way. In the Lit Yoga Method, we help you retrain your brain and body to move better for everyday life. Through physical therapy drills, yoga, functional mobility, core stability, and flexibility, the Lit Method rewires habitual movement patterns and postural imbalances to help you feel stronger, more energized, and more balanced, both on and off the mat. Our online platform, The Lit Daily, is designed for easy convenience with a robust offering of class types, so you can boost your energy while getting stress relief. Improved brain wiring means you will move with more ease and efficiency because we teach you the how and why behind movement choices, not just poses for the sake of poses. All movement teachers on the platform are certified by LIT and share a common language providing education with clear cues that give you the needed reinforcement for enhancing your movement habits. Thousands of students in over 50 countries get LIT to feel more confident, more powerful, and more alive. We offer two subscription options for all levels and bodies. The Lit Daily option consists of over 500 classes in our library, with so many categories I can't even list them, but some include short on time, injury prevention, stress reliefs, and different body parts. There's also a Tuesday and Thursday live class that's streamed on the daily, and there's always a class of the day to help you take the guesswork out of what class to do. Lit Daily members also get 50% off the monthly workshops. The Lit Prime subscription offer has everything in the daily, plus over 20 weekly live Zoom classes with Lit teachers providing real-time feedback. This is wonderful for community and to get your feedback from a teacher for your own alignment. We also get free monthly workshops in the Lit Prime option. Both of these are streamable right into any TV or device through an Android, iPhone, and iPad apps. Movement changes everything, and when we move better, we feel better. So sign up for our free two-week trial and see how getting lit can help you feel your best today and for years to come. I'm Laura Hyman, and welcome to Redefining Movement, a lit podcast designed to investigate all aspects of movement from my background in physical therapy and neuroscience. My mission is to help everyone find freedom through smarter movement patterns and compassion for ourselves and others. So together we can live our most uplifted lives, benefiting all beings. Welcome back to Redefining Movement's special series, Work Well. In this episode, we explore two exceptional platforms that take employee benefits to the next level. Modern Health and Wellable are both innovative solutions for companies designed to enrich physical, social, and mental well-being in the workplace. We discuss how these platforms go above and beyond the standard corporate benefit offerings and shape a more holistic and engaging experience for employees. Nick Patel is founder and CEO of Wellable. This holistic employee wellness platform focuses on not only physical activity, but also nutrition, sleep, and even the science of happiness, offering a comprehensive approach to health that extends beyond exercise alone. Wellable's platform is designed to be highly customizable. It offers a challenge library with turnkey solutions to help employees engage in wellness activities, recognizing the uniqueness of each company and its employees. Their customer success team also acts as consultants to optimize the health and engagement of an organization, promoting broader thinking about well-being rather than narrow or siloed approaches. Here's my conversation with Nick. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today about your company and about your philosophy. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's just launch right in. Can you tell me about Wellable and how and why you developed it? Yeah, Wellable is a holistic well-being platform, and we use the word platform because it's a technology solution primarily, but we also layer in services. Our ultimate goal and vision is to be holistically focused and also be kind of a one-stop shop for everything an employer may need. So we have designed the product to be modular because companies are in different stages of when they want to launch a wellness program. Sometimes they're new and fresh to it. Other ones are very mature, and it allows them to pick and choose what makes the most sense for them and also recognize that those preferences may change over time, or they may think something is of interest to the employee base, and they find out that's not, and they can kind of pivot and change along the way. And so when I say holistically focused, we cover the major dimensions of well-being, like physical activity, which is the most common, nutrition, sleep, but we also get into things around like purpose and the science of happiness, right? Thinking about charity, giving to others, is giving back to yourself in some ways. We cover all these different modules, which at the time when we first started, it was like a very novel concept. 
Now it feels a little bit more table stakes in terms of how people think about employee wellness programs. So it's just a sense of, you know, we've been in business for a little bit more than 10 years and how quickly things have evolved. First of all, did you see a need? Were you in the corporate setting? What was your background? And how did you decide that this was something that was needed? And then the construction of it, not just an in-person, but having this platform, which the scope is so much larger. When I first graduated college, I felt there were a lot of career opportunities for me. I was at the time going to be in investment banking. And for me, it was like, I want to be in an industry group that I could do good and do well in. And so I was from the beginning focused on either trying to be in education or healthcare. And I just was a technology advocate at the time and wanted to be in the technology group. So that's how I got my exposure to healthcare technology. Eventually, I would go on to be be at a couple of different banks. I would go on to work for one of my clients. And at the time, all three of the companies had employee wellness programs. So from my perspective, my late 20s, I'm thinking, oh, every company has this solution, not realizing how untrue that was, but all the solutions were different and they all weren't necessarily geared for someone like me. I did them because I got an incentive to do so, but I really wasn't bought into them. At the same time, new technologies were coming out. I think like literally the iPhone was a year and a half old when we started germinating the idea. Fitbit had just come out and it was not even the Fitbit you know. It's the Fitbit that literally clipped on your belt and it was like a Casio watch type display. All it did was steps and really the technology was that it would Bluetooth the data into a very, very basic app. That was what Fitbit was, but we thought that was the future, right? And all these new wearable companies were coming out. So really the thesis was a passion around health and well-being, the general philosophy that we're better off trying to prevent disease and try to cure it. And then a coalescing with this technology revolution that we thought was going to be the future. So the real thesis very early on was that we didn't need to develop these technologies. We just needed to incorporate them into a software platform that an employer could use. So Fitbit, great. Use it at the time. Jawbone, it's like a defunct wearable. It was kind of big. It was like, great, we can pull that in. You can have RunKeeper, you can have MyFitnessPal, you can pull all these apps and technologies in. And then you build around like the enterprise level features a company needs to launch a program. It could be as simple as a step challenge across multiple apps that track steps that aggregates into a single platform. It could be things like the ability to send emails and communications, onboard and offboard users at big companies that are happening all the time. So all those corporate features that you need to have a program, but really let the innovation happen in the consumer market. So a big push was like, this market's going to develop. We should embrace it, capture it within our ecosystem, and then deliver in a nice package that a company can use. I'm sure there's been a few, but what are some really big stumbling blocks or challenges that you have faced with whether it's the corporations have bought into it and then there's been a low uptake or what are some of the things that you have come across and maybe some of the solutions or some ideas that have sprung from those challenges? Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge we had early on, it wasn't actually designed to be an employee or employer-based solution. At the time, the ACA was just passed. Everyone knew that these individual exchanges were going to be launching. We had indication that there would be a lot of challenges at the state level about launching these exchanges, but they weren't really official yet. So everything was really, really early on. We were thinking like myself and some other folks as we were kind of thinking through this was that Right now, there are a lot of companies that we don't really love in the employee wellness space, but they're there. They're going to find ways to disrupt what you're doing. You're going to have to compete with them, but this is a brand new market. And their solutions that they were offering were designed for organizational level interventions. These new health plans are going to launch these individual exchanges and delivering to an individual is just very different than delivering to individuals within a company. You would so can you give an example like membership to a gym? Would that be an example of something that's given to everybody, but not necessarily an individual uptake? Is that what you mean? Well, one is just even taking a step back. When you define what is an employee wellness program, that definition varies a ton. It yeah. could be a company offers a gym reimbursement and they'll go, hey, that's our employee wellness program. Another company would say, hey, we encourage everyone to get an annual flu shot. And there are other ones who take this very comprehensive version of a platform and services and thinking about purpose and happiness and all these other holistic elements of well-being. And there's everything in between. And so that definition is a little bit different, but just by the nature of scale, it's easier to say, I have 100 employees in this office. I'm going to deliver whatever programming it may be, whether it's digital or on site. And that becomes a little bit easier to manage and come top down. An HR person has championed it. They have the communication access. All those things are in play. They also have financial incentives. Like your employer has a financial incentive for you to be healthy. Yes, it lowers health insurance costs and that's important, but also people who are healthier are happier. Personal happiness has been clearly shown to be linked to your professional happiness. Happiness is linked to retention. All these things are just so interconnected. It's even hard to even try to weave them out or even sometimes discuss them because where do you begin? They're just so tied together. 
And so in that scenario, that's a very different vision for how you want to be successful. But when you look at the individual basis, the idea of like a social connection is really difficult because these individual members don't know each other. They live in different cities. They have personal email. So we can't make sure like our communications always hits their inbox. Little things like that, that change it, that create challenges. And so our view was consumer technologies like Fitbit were arriving. We should create a wellness program really built in a way that I could go to Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts, where we're headquartered, and tell them, you're launching on the exchange on January 1st of this year. You should have a wellness program tied to the health plan, just like you do for all your other health plans designed for employers. And the big challenge we experienced were twofold. One, people were rushing to get ready for it. And so what's critical about a health plan isn't getting your employee wellness program, is can you process claims and eligibility? So we were a afterthought of all these bells and whistles, like we're rushing to get the core functionality out. The second thing is while they're rushing to get the core functionality out, there's a challenge in like every other week in Congress on whether this should be an individual mandate. So all the health plans pull back on whether they wanted to do it. Now, our personal belief was it was all going to get settled, but we had no timeline for that. So we had to stay alive. So we said, look, we have this technology, we can adapt it to be for the employer, right? We still think the thesis exists there. We just weren't focused on it because we would have to compete with people as opposed to very minimal competition in new markets. So it was just a strategic business decision we made, but it was like day one. While we're building this, we're just seeing challenges in the courts, in the Congress to this law and less and less investments and more and more skittishness on the side of the health plans to be active in the individual exchanges. In that regard, are the health plans interwoven with these wellness programs or can they be separated so you don't have to necessarily contend with some of those logistics? A little bit of both. And so health plans, I think more commonly, I'm trying to generalize here, always have a wellness program offering. It tends to be like less sophisticated. It maybe checks a couple of boxes. It makes you feel good to say, hey, we do offer an employee wellness program. And for many employers, that's fine. For the ones that are trying to do more, they have two options. One, they go to a health plan that does have a robust solution. So some of these health plans have gone out and acquired like a true employee wellness platform, like United Healthcare through their Optum Group, acquired Rally Health. There are other examples. There are also examples of health plans going out and purchasing a really robust wellness program from another vendor and layering in the cost into your premium and delivering it in that way. But more often than not, I feel like it's just a check the box with the groups. And then these companies who are looking for something more tend to go out into the market and find something direct. The other challenge is who's eligible for that wellness program. So health plan programs, more often than not, I believe, have, if you are a member of the medical plan, then you have access to this employee wellness solution. So if you look at a company, again, of like 100 people, maybe 80 people are actually members of the program, but the other 20 are not. And most employers want to offer benefits to everyone. And most employers who really appreciate employee well-being know that the health of those 20 people is still meaningful to them from a business perspective, not just because they can lower their healthcare costs. And so sometimes companies go, well, I really like my employee wellness program at my health plan. I'd love to take it. It's cheaper. Maybe it's even free, but it only addresses a percentage of my employee population. And that's just not aligned to where we want to be from a strategy perspective. And that lets them either come to us in general. And so how do companies utilize the platform? So I think if you talk to another vendor, they'll say, this is how we implement our programs. This is our goal. This is our philosophy. We came out there with the perspective that every company is unique and it's full of individuals who are also unique, all having different goals and objectives, different technology prowess, different interests in health and well-being. And so we weren't going to say, we know the magic recipe that's going to work for everyone. We let that HR group determine what makes the most sense for their population. And also recognizing that they don't always know that answer. They probably have a better guess than we do. But they will also learn along the way that this worked and this didn't. And so our ultimate goal is to create that level of customizability and configurability within the platform. We have some groups running just wellness challenges for us. And so what we define as a wellness challenge would be like step competition, either team or individual or a sleep challenge or what have you. They're common in workplaces, they're fun, they're engaging, and they'll do three to four a year, once a quarter or something. And they're really happy with that program. We have more involved programs that have well, it will be like a daily engagement app. Like every day you're logging something, every day you're really doing something and earning points and unlocking rewards and a lot of stuff that falls in between that. The ability to do that within our platform is the hallmark. It's kind of one of the big selling pieces of what makes us successful. And so if you look at our client base of, I think, over 700 companies right now working with us, they're all doing something different, sometimes very different, sometimes slightly different, but they all have their own unique spin on it. 
That's incredible to be able to make it so customizable based on what each HR head would think is most relevant for their particular company. That's super cool. I was looking at your platform. And so can you tell me a little bit about the challenge library that's in there? Yeah. So one of our maybe initial features was the concept of this wellness challenge that I alluded to before, but it's a way for people to have these healthy competitions with each other, right? And at the end of it, typically some client gives like a word to the winning team. It could be a trophy, it could be gift cards, it could be a whole number of things. And so we've taken that concept, which was really popular at the step level. That's like a very common thing. Who can take the most steps in a month or four week period and really drag that out across all dimensions of health and well-being. So from our perspective, every topic that we're trying to cover has an associated challenge. So we have over three dozen challenges that are turnkey in this what we call challenge library that makes it really administratively easy to launch a program. If you wanted to create your own challenge from scratch, you do have that ability, but our challenge library includes all the email templates, all the graphics, all the iconography, the ability to customize the number of weeks and start dates. You have some flexibility, but you're somewhat contained. But if you really feel like you want to go and like have this very clear vision of how you want to manage a program, you have that flexibility. But that challenge library is really meant to address the need that a lot of companies, especially smaller ones, don't have a dedicated wellness resource. They have an HR person who's been championed to lead this, but that HR person also manages payroll or something else. And it's really one small piece of their day-to-day. And even though you may have a great piece of software, it's only as good as the people using it. And so we try to lower that administrative burden. And that's what the challenge library tries to do. In addition to having that, it sounds like you have some kind of engagement channel, again, to unburden the HR person. Do you have people on your staff that help to engage with the different employees in these challenges? Or is that built into the program already? It's built into our delivery model. So one of the things we learned early on, we like we can be a software platform. We had no idea about even getting to the services business or really having this robust customer success division. But what we learned is that we could have all these great features, but people who are not experts in health and well-being, who don't wake up every day thinking about organizational health, don't necessarily have the know-how to optimize for that solution. So we invest heavily into a group we call customer success, right? So every client has a customer success manager who really in the perfect world serves as a consultant. They actually help you with technical things, but really the value is that they are organizational health experts who can help say, yes, you can configure and customize your program that way. I'm happy to show you how to do that. But here are some things we think that you're not really achieving your goals that you're trying to accomplish. So when we bring a new customer in, we go through this like lengthy implementation process, which includes like an intake form, which are basic questions like, why did you purchase Wallable? How do you define success? And based on those comments, we can say, from what I understand, this is what you're trying to accomplish. And I think what you're setting up, while good in theory, is not going to work well in practice. And maybe here are some suggestions on the way and just help them improve their program and really optimize it for success. And when you're getting new clients, especially I would say in the last, say, three or four years because of COVID and all these things, do you find that people are coming in with this more integrative, holistic quest? Or are they like, wow, we just need the physical or we need social because people have been isolated or this mental health obviously is huge. How much are people requesting these siloed approaches or most of them recognizing that there's such a interconnectedness of all of those different parts of well-being? We definitely have groups come in and thinking, I just want a basic challenge, a step program, activity program, and that's how I'm going to enter. They don't even think about the next step. Even if that is their first start, well, you're launching this program. Does it end there? Are you going to keep on running the same activity program every quarter? Like, Is that going to be interesting? Forget about the health benefits aside. Like, is it going to be compelling to want to participate? And they don't really think about that because they're not thinking that far in the future about the program, things that we think about when we're in like year eight with a client about what to do. So. It's all over the place, but in that sales process, and certainly in the customer success area, we're preaching holistic health and well-being. So great. If you're looking for this one specific point need, we can do that for you. You need to start thinking more broadly because it's the right perspective from a health perspective. It's the right perspective from an engagement perspective to think beyond just whatever your tunnel vision is focusing on at that point. How would you effectively encourage movement and physical exercise in the workplace? This is a situation where obviously the company can do it at an organizational level. And there's ways that, you know, now offices are designed about separating the printer and like the bathroom area, right? Because unintentionally people are taking more steps and things of that nature. Personally, at a company like ours, not every meeting needs to be in front of a computer. And so if you can get a walking meeting, our office is right next to the Boston Common. So we're very fortunate in that way that we can like literally hop out and like be in a park and walk around. And that's always beneficial. So you see that all the time at our company and organization. 
So companies should just figure out what exactly that means to them. Sometimes it's structural by moving your office around. But I think more importantly is I think people will find a way to incorporate activity in their day if they are given the latitude and the encouragement to do so. We personally give the latitude, like you don't have to be in front of a computer. If you take a meeting, walking, great. There's some meetings for me personally that I'm not on video because I want to walk. We have walking desks here. So if you need to be on video and need to be in front of a computer, but still want to take those steps, that option is here. And people use them. Probably not. I think I use them more than most. It's available. But more importantly, I think we just give people the right and encouragement. Yes, that's amazing. I mean, everybody probably wants to work for you. (laughs) I would, yeah. The other thing is the physical impacts everything. So it's going to impact your mental state. It impacts productivity. You can't sit in front of a desk and not move. Whether you're just taking calls at a call center or not, everyone's going to get mentally fatigued by that. So I think people are, for the most part, recognizing the importance of the crossover of all these things, giving people the opportunity to move their bodies and how that's going to impact their mental state how that is going to impact their social well-being. And I just am so appreciative for what you're doing. And if anyone wants to reach out, what's the best way to make a call? I'm sure that you probably do some consulting or answering questions for corporations, small and large, that are interested in getting Wellable in their program. Yeah. So I mean, if you go to our website, it's Wellable, W-E-L-L-A-B-L-E.co. So not .com. So it's a point of confusion. But you go to our website, we blog a ton. We cover all the topics around organizational health, connecting what we're seeing at the consumer market, how does that relate to what you want to do within your organization? And we touch on other just HR topics. So I'm talking to an HR person. If we're doing a good job on that, that's a great resource just to learn about health and well-being and broadly HR considerations and topics. And then from there, there's ways to contact us depending on what you're looking for. Let's hope that this is the next wave of the future, or you're just continuing the work you've been doing over the last decade, because we know that people at work have been suffering in all kinds of ways. And if we want to continue to be successful in all the ways, we have to first take care of the people who are doing the work. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Next, I speak with Dr. Jessica Waltros, the Director of Clinical Research and Scientific Affairs with Modern Health. She is an innovative leader in the mental health space who brings a wealth of expertise from her work at Modern Health, a platform transforming how employers provide mental health care benefits. Jessica and I talk about the challenges of the current healthcare system for therapists and clients alike, the emphasis on fair compensation, and the utilization of technology to match clients with the care they need efficiently. We also touch on the current trends in mental health, changes necessary to combat global burnout, and the intersection of mental wellness and workplace well-being. Here's my conversation with Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for taking the time today to be here with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Well, I'd love to launch right in and have you tell us about Modern Health. So Modern Health is a mental health platform. I think it's probably the simplest way to think about it, which doesn't simplify it to those of us that aren't working in the field. But basically what you can think of with Modern Health is it's a benefit that employers can provide to their employees so that they can work to take care of their mental health. What we've seen over many years is it's really hard to get mental health care, right? People traditionally either need to go through their health insurance or use an employee assistance program, and it can just take a really long time to get connected to a provider. There's not a lot of innovation in that space when it comes to app-supported things and digital content. And so Modern Health is really intended to like fill that gap. So we have a range of offerings, everything from digital content, meditation, psychoeducational courses, up to matching with a coach and matching with a therapist who does evidence-based therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy. So that full range, all of those modalities of care. And if your employer provides you modern health, you can download the app, you can get in there and you can get started. That's kind of what we do. So in other words, you're like the bridge that's serving the corporations. We often will hear about better health or something on all these podcasts. Mm-hmm. And that's like something anybody can just go and find, but this is more strategically from the corporations offering this to their employees. Exactly. Yeah. So some of those offerings that are out there, some of those digital mental health offerings are direct to consumer. That is one option. Modern sells directly to employers. So the employers are our clients, but we're actually selling our mental health services to our members who are the employees of a given organization. And I imagine being in that position, one might think that you would have to do your due diligence even more than, say, the direct to consumer because you are the medium to the provider, but also you're representing the providers in a way. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, we're asking companies to make a pretty significant investment in mental health care. And so the expectations around quality, around clinical outcomes, people don't want to buy something if it doesn't work. And when you're buying something for maybe thousands of employees, you want to know that it actually works. And so I actually lead our clinical research team and scientific affairs. And that's where our work comes in of checking whether or not the care that's provided through modern health is actually helping people get better and is actually delivering that value of investment for those organizations. How long has Modern Health been around offering their services? We have been around since 2017. What have you noticed, obviously, since COVID and a lot more variability and work from home or hybrid situations, and then compounded with the overall global stress that COVID caused or exacerbated, have you seen a skyrocketing need in the last few years? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the simple answer to that is yes. I would say even before COVID, so as a psychologist, this is something that I'm thinking about a lot. I would say even before COVID, we were seeing increasing conversations around mental health. We were seeing it show up in very public places where, like, at least at the beginning of my training, that's not necessarily where those conversations were happening. And when COVID hit, it was just so impactful for all of us, right? It wasn't a trauma that like one group of individuals experienced or even just an individual, really we're talking about this global impact event that of course had really difficult physical health implications, but also has had really difficult mental health implications. And so I think what we saw is then we really hit this tipping point of people talking very openly about the importance of mental health and what that leads to is really addressing the gaps in the mental health care system, right? So if we're all talking about it a lot, saying it's really important, then we start running into the fact that globally, for example, there's just like not enough therapists for us to all go see therapists. We start running into the gaps of how we actually get care. And so I think in the past few years, that's why it's become so important for companies like Modern to exist is the way that mental health care has been done for so many years just isn't working. And COVID really opened that conversation. Additionally, one of the things that switched really quickly was telehealth. So for years, psychologists and therapists have been talking a lot about the need for mental health to be delivered virtually. And there's been a lot of barriers to that. It's been really challenging. And when COVID hit, there was no choice. And we could all deliver our skills online. And the research really supports this, right? So we don't see different outcomes when people do their care via telehealth. But what I have seen is that from a preference standpoint, people seeking therapy now have more opportunity to do that. Like first, you know, if there's not a therapist in your specific location, but also if you take your kiddo to soccer practice and you want to do your session in the car where they're at soccer practice, you can do that versus driving 20 minutes across town, doing your session, coming back, you know, all of those pieces. And so there's definitely been huge shifts as a function of COVID. The other piece that I would call out, I think we expected things to just kind of go back to normal and we're just still seeing a lot of strain on people. And so it kind of started there, but we're still really continuing the need for those sorts of things. I'm curious how vigilant and or successful is modern at really meeting the demands? Because for instance, one of my brothers is a psychiatrist. He's talked a lot about how the supply is so much lower in terms of professionals, the demand is so much greater. Like with modern, do you have like, you are going to be guaranteed to find a resource? Because I imagine that is super powerful. Now, not everybody is contending with this, but you know, like my brother is saying, like for every 20 people he has that try to work with him, he just doesn't have space in his schedule. Yeah, that's really common. We hear that a lot from providers. And what that turns out happening for people seeking care is six, eight, 12 week wait lists to get in to see some sort of provider. At Modern, I think it's important to think about our multiple modalities. So first and foremost, if you wanted to work with a provider, so that could be a licensed therapist, could also be a certified coach if you had less severe needs. Our current time to care to first available appointment is less than one day globally. I think about what happens when people who don't have modern, right? Because I'm a psychologist, people still are going to text me and be like, hey, do you know a therapist here? Do you know a therapist there? The truth of the matter is, is that the best way that people right now can go find a therapist, if they have insurance, is to like go see who's in network, maybe go to psychology today, see if there's therapists out there that take their insurance. We know that gets really difficult really quickly because it's not great for therapists to take insurance. They don't get reimbursed at a great rate. 
And so you're running into this like long wait list or no availability. So people just go out of out of pocket. They have to go out of network. So at Modern, what we really did is you have to think about all of the incentives, right? We need therapists to not be burnt out, which means we don't want them seeing a bazillion clients, right? right? We want them seeing a number that feels reasonable to them, which means we then need to compensate them well enough that they don't have to do that. And then really, we use tech to enable the ability to make sure that people have capacity, right? So instead of giving somebody a list of like 12 people, give people a list of six people that actually have availability. And this is the other piece of tech, right? Like when I matched with my coach through Modern, you do some assessments, some onboarding, it gives you a recommendation. And then the providers that are shared with you in the app all have availability. And then you just book them in the app. The truth of the matter is, is if you're struggling with symptoms of anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever it might be, the last thing that you want to be doing is picking up the phone repeatedly, yes. trying to get somebody to call you back. So yeah. this bridge between rigorous mental health care and tech is really where companies like Modern can step in. So time to care is one of the quickest ways that we think about that when people want to work one-to-one with a provider. The other piece of this, and this is always interesting for me to talk about as a therapist, is people don't always want to see a provider. We have a study that we did with Rutgers where we asked people that came into Modern Health what they wanted to do. Do you want to work one-to-one with somebody? Do you want to work on your own? Would you like to go to group things? And what we found is actually that 56% of our members, when they first come in, didn't want to work one-to-one with a provider. That tells us that we have to have other things available to them because if the only thing we have is one-to-one, they're just not going to do anything. And so that's why we have our digital content. That's why we have our group offerings, which are called circles. All of these things to get people something that they can do to take care of their mental health, and then ultimately potentially drive further engagement. So maybe it would be a good idea clinically for me to meet with a therapist, but I'm not ready. But if I do some of the courses and maybe I attend a group and I have this really positive experience and I feel like I'm learning something, Maybe now I'm more open to seeing a therapist and then I can match through modern health for that. So we're really thinking about it in terms of like, yeah, can we get people to -to one-to-one care quickly? But also if people don't want that or they don't need it, what do we get you? And that's the beauty of tech. You go into an app, it takes three to five minutes to onboard with modern. And now at your fingertips, you have a ton of evidence-based content right there to get started with. What engagement levels do you see from your clients like compared to traditional benefits? So with like a traditional employee assistance program, you could see somewhere sometimes between two to 5% engagement. I've seen those numbers be a little bit lower for larger clients. Sometimes that's one to 3%. So you don't see great engagement there. For us globally, I believe that the global engagement is between 20 and 32%. So we see a lot more engagement and we think about engagement in terms of coming in and doing a thing, not just like onboarding or registering, but like, did you come in? Did you complete an assessment? Did you go to a group? Did you do a session? So we see a relatively high uptake of that. And it's also a thing that we're really focused on. And so this is the other really interesting thing is that Sometimes incentives don't entirely align, but for us, driving engagement is actually a really core portion of what we do, which is really important to our clients. And so our customer success managers are thinking about how do I help my clients drive more engagement? What is it that they need? Do we need to offer private circles? What sorts of content do we have that can help them drive people into new and different offerings? And then we're also innovating on what our offerings look like, what will help people get involved. And again, driving engagement over the long term instead of just like you came in and you did one thing and then you never came back. That's not necessarily what we're driving for. That's kind of how we're thinking about it. It's really amazing for anybody who's listening who's not exactly sure what we're talking about in terms of numbers. Just imagine you're offered this as a resource and typical benefits, one to 3% of the overall staff employees are utilizing them. To me, when I found that out too, and I've seen that because we have some corporate offerings and work really hard too, because that just is crazy. You're getting this basically free benefit and it's not being utilized. It'd be interesting to know the data behind, like why don't more people engage when they are given this? And I wonder if it's just like one thing that's tacked on and either they're not aware of, or it just put in the back of their mind, 
because we offer an online platform. And when we looked at the statistics too, we were like, what? Only five or 10% are using this. So we've also looked at like ways of maybe they need in some interactive Zooms where we're actually talking through some of the movements. Do you have any ideas behind that as a psychologist? Like, I mean, your numbers are good, but in general, why more employees are not taking advantage of some really amazing benefits? Yeah. I mean, I think you hit on a few things. I think sometimes we don't know it exists and then sometimes we don't know how it's applicable to us. At Modern Health, we talk a lot about well-being and we talk about kind of our five pillars of well-being. So we extend beyond just emotional care to things like physical health, our financial well-being, our professional well-being, and also our relationship. That becomes more applicable than just the mental health app. So I think really broadening that is a part of it. And then ultimately, I think the thing that we do really well is really designing a member experience that's intended to be delightful. And the truth of the matter is, is that we didn't design things where we were thinking about whether or not people liked them, right? We designed things to be effective, which is great and incredibly important. The therapies that we have strong evidence for, we know that they work, but we never really designed them to be delightful. We didn't intend for people to like enjoy them. We wanted them to just get better. This beauty of the marrying of rigorous care with tech is you have functions like we have this amazing user research group that's thinking through what makes a member want to engage with this? And then somewhere in there is the intersection of what is good quality care and what is delightful that people will return to. And that's what we create. I am not a designer, right? Like I don't have that capability. And we have teams that do things that it looks good. It works right. It makes you want to do more of it. And I think that is a huge piece of that. In addition to all the work that happens outside of the app on our customer success side, where we're making sure that the leaders that are putting this out understand the product, that they can talk about it, that they can drive people into it. So there's so many domains to this. And traditionally, psychologists or therapists, like we've really only thought about what happens in the room with the individual. And there's just so much more to getting people to engage in those sorts of things. Are there any trends that you see occurring that you'd like to share with us? Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately we have to continue to think beyond just the individual, right? So as a psychologist, like I was trained to think about individual level interventions. We know that are effective, especially when it comes to symptom reduction. And we want to make sure that people have access to those. We also can't deny the systemic influences that people are experiencing and how that impacts them, right? So whether that be from an organizational standpoint, whether that be too much work and not enough resources, that's going to lead to burnout. We have to address that. Or managers that don't feel comfortable talking about mental health. We have to think about the systemic level impact. That also extends to things like social determinants of health. We know that that's really important when it comes to physical health. It's also really important when it comes to mental health. We want to think about those sorts of things. As mental health organizations and providers, we really have to start thinking beyond symptoms alone. So decreases and reductions in anxiety and depression symptoms as measured by our standard measures, like the PHQ assesses depression, the GAD assesses anxiety. Those are really important. We also really know that our treatments address those, but that doesn't tell us about a human's overall thriving, right? We have to understand whether or not people feel like their relationships have improved. People feel like their functioning has improved. How are people able to take care of their physical health after taking care of their mental health? Those are the sorts of things that really clue us into whether or not the things that we're doing to support people are really supporting them in their entire life, or if we've just reduced symptoms and then left them to figure out the rest. So I think that those are really important trends, both one on the organizational side and then the other on the mental health side. Those are some of the things that we're thinking about a lot. And for us at Modern, we continue to be really focused on how do we deliver care that's impactful for everyone? So there are always going to be individuals that have high acuity needs that are experiencing things like really severe major depressive disorder, or suicidal ideation. And so we have products that are intended to help those individuals reduce their symptoms, be safe, get stable, whatever it is that they need. We always make sure that we have that. We still are really focused on being proactive, right? We don't want people to have to wait until then yes. to be able to take this care of So much health. like the modern medical model as a physical yeah. therapist, the same thing, you know, we're just realizing like so short-sighted to yes. be like only responding when there's pain or discomfort. Like there's so much we can do to prevent it or ameliorate it, but it's hard when you're answering to the system that 
trends through the insurance company and what they dictate and how they reimburse. And it, yeah. Yeah. Getting those incentives aligned is challenging, right? And convincing people that this is important, you know, it can yeah. be challenging. I think it's really useful when we have clients that know they have longer tenure, like your employers aren't here for one year, you know, your average yeah. tenure, maybe five to 10 years, like preventative care matters for you, even if you aren't interested in how your individuals are doing, which most HR most leaders, are. most yeah. leaders are at the end of the day. I mean, this is impacting your bottom line. If your people are struggling, they're not productive. They're not showing up to work. They're taking leaves of absence. They're using higher medical care. If you can address that, you're going to save yourself money. You're going to get more productivity. People are just going to do better. Like the morale at your company is better. All of those things kind of get packaged together. And it's kind of one of those things like the people that get it, get it. So that's a really important piece. And are those companies in terms of like saving on healthcare, do you have ways of also collecting data on that? How once modern came in as a form of intervention and assistance, like how did that impact the healthcare overall? We have a model that makes some hypotheses about how people could save, but we're actually in the process right now of doing some analyses on actual savings, medical claim savings. So taking a look at what happened in the year before modern, what happens when you implement modern. And I think now more than ever with rising medical claims, even if you just stop the rise, <laughs> that's a save. It can be hard for people to think through it that way. That comes up a little bit sometimes in our conversations. We have some data to show improvements in lost productivity, really. And people are kind of always like, well, maybe. And they a little bit the same with retention. We know that people that engage in modern are more likely to stay with their company. But those numbers can be a little bit more abstract than actual money that you're going to pay out for modern. So sometimes those conversations can get a little tricky. Right. It's um, like so anecdotal. We, but hey, listen, there's a lot you can see. Again, it could just be like days at work versus days not at work. And you can surmise some of that has got to be from burnout, stress, lack of yep. sleep, et cetera. Yeah. The data tells us that when people are experiencing mental health concerns, they're having issues in all of those areas, right? They're not showing up. They're not able to concentrate the way that they'd like to. And I know, I mean, ultimately, this is another reason that we think about outcomes outside of just symptom reduction, you know? So I think I mentioned we have a paper that's currently under review where we found that modern health members became more physically active as a function of their modern health utilization. And that's just for mental health care, right? So we're rolling out some processes like now what happens if we actually target these things? When people are are moving their bodies, there are so many improvements for them, whether it be in their mental health or their physical health. That's just really important. And modern health is helping them do that. So it's one of the reasons that we think about all those outcomes is to help organizations and leaders really think about like, oh, how much better could my entire organization feel as a function of implementing modern? Do you have any hopes and dreams of where you want modern to go and your place in it and what you'd like to see in the world of corporate wellness? I think that modern and the field more broadly have the opportunity to really address a healthcare gap that's impacting everyone. Whether or not we are the people seeking care, we know people that need care, we know people that need to be able to take care of their mental health, we're all impacted by this. And so I think continuing to really provide people with options to take care of their mental health, seeing members and seeing individuals more broadly start to think about our mental health the same way that we think about our physical health. This is not something to be ignored until it's just so bad I can't function, but like, what can I do now to take care of myself? I think all of those things are areas that, you know, as a psychologist, I have really enjoyed seeing and I hope to continue seeing. Ultimately, I think from a corporate perspective, seeing more organizations really understand the impact of these sorts of choices. We're asking so much from employees all the time. And we know burnout is on the rise, not just in the US, but also globally. And ultimately, like we need to think about organizational level change to take care of them but also thinking about solutions like a modern where people can take care of themselves. And so seeing more companies really step into that and take that on as part of their mission for workplace well-being, that's ultimately where I think modern will continue to thrive. And then for us as an organization, we continue to double down in terms of, you know, we have this great breadth of services and how we think about it. 
And for us in the coming years, it will really be about going deeper. How do we drive outcomes even better, right? We've got great clinical outcomes. How do we get people to those sorts of outcomes quicker or in new ways? Are there different innovative ways that we can drive those outcomes? How do we continue to improve our care and our quality? And ultimately, how do we prove it and speak out to people about that? That's an area that obviously I'm directly responsible for and always thinking about how do we tell mental health stories in a way that's really compelling so that it's not just a bunch of psychologists or therapists in a room talking to each other, but how do we get that information out there in a way that's really actionable for people that need it? So those are all some of the things that I see us thinking about in the coming years. I love that. And to use your words and to have more delight in the workspace and in the personal health experience. So thank you so much. It was uh, really a joy and so informative to talk to you and what you're doing with Modern sounds amazing. So thank you so much, Dr. Jessica. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Redefining Movement. If you like what you've heard, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to leave us a rating and review or share with someone you know. Check us out at www.litmethod.com.